Welcome everyone to the Best of Sound Notion TV 2011 show. This episode that you're watching or listening to is Sound Notion, Music is Hard, and Streamers and Punches all rolled into one. So if you don't watch all of our shows, uh, you'll get a little taste of some of the ones that you haven't seen before. Um, we're taking a couple of weeks off, giving everybody time to, to spend a, a few weeks with their family and friends and maybe do a little bit of traveling. And instead of doing regular episodes for this couple of weeks, we're dropping in this compilation of some of the best, uh, what we think is the best, hopefully you agree, of what we've done this year. It's been a great year for Sound Notion TV in that before this year it didn't exist and now it does. Um, we started Sound Notion back in January. The beginning of the summer we added Music is Hard, the end of the summer, we added streamers and punches. We're really proud of what we've done. Um, we're going to start off with some of what we think is the best of the the baby of the family, streamers and punches. Um, so we've got just a couple of clips for that. Uh, you, you'll notice that we have just a couple of clips for streamers and punches. We have a couple of more clips for Music is Hard and a lot more clips for Sound Notion just because we've done more of those next two so first we're going to hear this uh, a, a bit of a, this great interview that the guys did with uh, film composer Bruce Broughton. And then we'll see a little bit of a documentary from uh, what Bill Witham made of a recording session with a film score that Kevin Wilt wrote. Uh, so here you go with that stuff. Let me sound like an old guy, first of all, and, and tell, you how was, <laughs> let me tell you how I was trained because the, the process... <coughs> the process has actually changed as the technology has changed. Um, when I first began this, so I began in television, I began working with CBS television, and um, every episode that we would do began in a projection room. I mean, you'd actually walk into a theater and watch film. And then um, in the next hour, you'd bring the, the social producer in or whoever was in charge, the director or whatever, and you sit there and you go through the film with the music editor. And you'd pick, you know, you do the spotting session. We're going to start here, we're going to end there, all that kind of stuff. Right. Then the music editor would be making notes as to all the starts and the stops and would, would go back to his office and would present you with the spotting notes, which was a basic breakdown of where the music was going to begin. At that point, the process could start because you start thinking over what the orchestra was going to be. You know, you started, you could sure. through the cues, you go, oh, that's right, we're playing this, but we're not playing that. So you could sort of see the theme dramatically of what you were doing. You could construct a color for it, a dramatic color. The real, and you might even construct a theme if you were really on top of it. But then basically you're waiting for the timing notes to show up. And once the timing notes showed up, you'd sit there with a, you guys probably don't use these, with a stopwatch. you sit there with a stopwatch and you would, you know, you'd do your timings. There were no computers. There were no videotapes, they're just, you know, you do it like this, and you would, you would write it from your memory of the scene as it was being, oh, that's not the same thing. <laughs> it's, a, it's a stopwatch. <laughs> you need, you need or, uh, okay. Anyway. Um, <laughs> anyway, so you, you'd write it from memory, and the, the uh, descriptions would, you'd say, oh, yeah, I remember that cut, and I remember that dissolve, and I remember the feeling in that. And the thing that I used to get out of that was, I would get a better dramatic feeling of the scene because I didn't have it in front of me. I had it inside me. Uh, ah. It's very poetic. Okay, so now yeah. you switch ahead, you know, 30, <laughs> 40 years, and now we have digital technology. So instead of going into a projection room, I can't remember the last time I went into a projection room to see a, a movie or a TV show. Now they show it to you in somebody's office. You sit there on a laptop or you sit there on a, on a big computer and you look on a screen. And you play it back and forth, and you can stop. And then they send you. They send. That's my computer telling the time. Um, <laughs> they send you a digital <laughs> file, so you embed it yourself into your own computer. And you and the music editors may or may not exist, but very often you sit there and you do your own timings. You've got it frame by frame. You've got the sympathy. So you sit there. So then your choices are, depending upon how you're going to uh, create the music, if you're doing a synth score. Do I bother going to the piano or do I just sit here and play it in and work it out? So sometimes I've done that. I've sat and I've just set up my, here, let's, let me show you this. See, this is my, I mean, it's very much like what you've got. There's my keyboard and, you know, all my stuff. And there's a piano in the background. You can see all that. 
So um, sometimes I'll sit here at the keyboard and I'll just work it out. Um, the last movie I did just a couple of weeks ago was a, was a very low budget independent that I did for a friend. It was all mm. on synth, but I decided not to do the programming myself because I stink at it. Um, <laughs> so I went to the piano. I did all my sketching on the piano. I put it immediately into Sibelius. And then I sent the files to somebody who did all the, um, all the synth work. And then I had to, I think that process was a little bit different for me because it was the first time that I didn't have any control on the inputting. And he did a great job. I mean, he did all the mixing and we went through the mixing session and we went and mixed into the film and it, it turned out great. Um, so that one was sort of half and half. At other times, Interesting. now that I've got a, an entirely an acoustical situation, I'll just sit at the piano. And then after I sit at the piano, I get lazy and I'll put it into the sequencer just to make sure that it works. So I've got the picture there. And go, oh, no, no. But the, the biggest problem I have is that I find the synth lies. It just, it doesn't tell you the truth as to what it sounds like. And it doesn't tell you the truth as to what it's actually going to feel like. That is, right. if you're going to use a, an acoustical thing. Um, my wife is a violinist. And... Um, I recently recorded a violin piece, a concerto like piece up in Toronto. And of course I mocked the whole thing up and I gave the guys the mock-up and, and it's a good mock-up and I got a pretty good sound for the violin. When I play it for her, she just goes, oh, 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 you know, <laughs> it's not a real violin. <laughs> right. To hear her right, right. Plays, or even to hear uh, the, the fellow who, who recorded it. I mean, it's, it becomes music when they play it. On my keyboard, it's just sound, you know, it's a, it's a right. performance sort of, it's like, it's like a Frankensteinian thing, you know. I mean, it's there's an sure. arm, and there's a head, and there's an ear, and all that kind of stuff. But is it a human being? Absolutely. Game? And, you know. Yeah. So the process is um, these days. It's however I can get to it. I think sure. that we're, we're all computer savvy. Um, I understand that even John Williams has had to, to suffer mock-ups. But that's the other thing. In in the time when I was doing it, in the in the dark days, in the early dark days before videotape, before computers. Yeah. The only thing you ever um, audited was the theme, you know. Like I remember playing the theme for Barry Levinson to Young Sherlock Holmes. He came over to the office. Mark Johnson, the producer, came over, and I sat there on my piano and I played da 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 dee da 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 da. And like a fool, I played through it the first time and immediately asked him what he thought. He said, <laughs> "Not much." <laughs> <laughs> so I played it again, you know. I since then found out you got to play a theme at least three times before somebody starts getting. Ah. Uh... So okay. Barry was too impressed, and then I played the other theme, the dum da 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 dum da da da, and thing. And he wasn't too impressed on that either. But it's all on the piano, and you know, it sounds like chopsticks. I mean, if, if you right. don't know what the flutes are or where the, you know, it, and I don't think that if if John Williams or Jerry Goldsmith or Alex North sat down and played their themes to me, I'm not sure I could tell what they were either. You know, because you sure. don't know what they have in their head. Sure. So we got to the recording session. We're on Abbey Road, and we've got our big orchestra out there. And I play this theme that just a few weeks ago I played, and he thought was, yeah. And he came and said, man, that's, that's beautiful. Are we going to hear that again? I said, yeah, that's your main theme. Yeah, I know, but are we going to hear that again? I said, it's your main theme. <laughs> because the difference between what the piano uh, and what the orchestra yeah. was, you know, it was, it was just night and day. So, sure. So, I mean, that's all part of the process. You do whatever you can to get it. That's hilarious. Yeah. Do you spend most of your time in Sibelius then, or do you use other sequencing programs like, say, Pro Tools or Digital Performer? I, I use Performer. Um, okay. I, in fact, right now I'm working on a flute piece. It's a, um, it's a commission. And mm -hmm. uh, I go to the piano, I work it out, and I try, to, I try to get it as well as I can on the piano, mostly figuring out all the notes and the spacing. And then I put it immediately into Sibelius so that I can have a record of it. And then I put it into... Okay. Um, I put it into performer so that I can hear it. Now, the performer performance is better than Sibelius. Sibelius is really sucky. So yeah. I put it into performer. And from performer, what I get is a sense of time. Because I, as I hear the piece go by, I think, oh, I need two more bars there, or I need three more beats, or, you know, I don't need that section. I mean, at least I get the sense of the performance. And even then, sure. I'll look at the music, and I'll look at it, and I'll stand back, and I'll read it in my own head. It's always better up here than it is anywhere else. I mean, it, it's... Yeah. I would think that that's the biggest that's the biggest thing, the biggest change in music from a creative standpoint, whether you're doing concert music or doing film music, whatever kind of music it is, is that you really have to trust yourself. 
it's a it's a met, metabolic effort, right? I mean, all of you guys, you got four composers right. in front of me. So there, here we are, five composers. We all compose at different rates. You know, some of us compose. Some of our speed is really fast. Some of us kind of slow. Some of us like to have long phrases. Some of us like to have short phrases. Some of us like to stay on a chord for a long time. Some guys can't stand to use it more than once. You know, all these things because it has to do with the way our heart pumps blood through our system. You know, or how we feel things, right. or how, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then you put it on the page. If you trust the technology to tell you what it's going to be, you're screwed. Because it's just unless you're doing a techno piece. If you're doing a techno piece, then you then you got right. to do it. But if you're doing a piece for live performers, you just have to trust that that what you've got there, when you finally let it go, that it's right, and then you get it out of your performer. And they're going to bring something to it too. They they're going to do things. I mean, I've I've had this over and over again. There was a, a piece a couple of years ago. Uh, it was a commission for a, a brass group, and I heard. Um, I heard a couple of performances and I thought, oh, I guess I don't know how to write for this very well. You know, I, I, showed, it to, <laughs> I showed it to a friend of mine, a conductor, and he, uh, he looked at the piece and he went over to um, Manchester in England and the uh, Royal Northern School and he wrote me a note. He said, we're going to be doing your piece in April or something like that. So I thought, oh, I'm going to go over and see just how bad this piece is, you know. So I, <laughs> I went over and I heard the rehearsal and I'm thinking, man, this isn't... This isn't too bad. In fact, this is pretty good. In fact, I think this is probably going to be really good. You know, so <laughs> in the evening, and people were jumping out of their chairs. They were so excited by the performance. And the I give that to the conductor. He found something in the music that I had completely dismissed. You know, because I heard a couple of poor performances of it. I didn't have the proper people doing it. I got the right guy with the right right group, and suddenly it was the right piece. So. Let me say something to you guys. Too. <laughs> because you're in Michigan and because you're in St. Louis, I don't know how involved you are in film music, and I don't know what your intentions are, what your ambitions are, but I found as I travel around that a lot of people think that because they're not in Los Angeles, that what they're doing, because they're not working in films, that what they're doing isn't quite as important, or that it's not quite as interesting, or not, and you really want to get over that one, because for one thing, I found that there's a lot of opportunity locally, wherever you are, and you, a lot of you guys seem to have found it. Uh, the process is the same no matter where you are. Whenever you're writing music, it's hard. Um, like one of my teachers said to me once, he said, the most important part of the pencil is the eraser. And so it's either the eraser or the delete button, you know, because I mean? you make a lot of changes. Just over and over and over you're doing it. Whether you're working on a film or you're working on a flute piece, whatever it is, uh, you just have to know that what you're doing is important and that the music that you're creating is yours, you know. And that whether you're in Michigan or whether you're in St. Louis or whether you're in Los Angeles, whether you're on a film or whether you're on a concert stage, whatever it is, what you're doing is as valid as the next guy. So I, you know, that's my raw, raw speech for you guys. <laughs>
Uh, uh, Jonathan and Brian, Brian, I think you guys probably need yeah, to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice to meet you. Yeah. 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 Uh, sorry, everybody. This is Brian, the producer of the film. So, Brian. Hey, Brian. Thank you, guys. We need, uh, yeah. So, here we are at the end of the session. Kevin has finished recording with the string quartet, and the musicians are leaving. As you can see there, and there's the director, Jonathan, looking at the musicians as they're leaving. Kevin, do you have any thoughts after the session is over? Uh, overall, I thought it went pretty well. Uh, we, I mean, we, we timed it just about perfectly because we, we just just ran into our last amount of time. But, you know, I was very happy. We got really lucky. We have uh, a really strong quartet of players. And, you know, I, I was a little worried because the music was a little on the tricky side. And we only had three hours to record about six or seven minutes of it. But... We got it all, and I think it'll end up sounding really nice. All right, great. And when is the premiere of the movie? I have no idea. Okay. As it always does. My job's done. <laughs> Fair enough. No, actually, uh, Jonathan, the director, said the premiere will probably be in about two months or something. Like that, so okay. I'm sure we'll have information for you up at the uh, Streamers and Punches website. We definitely will. All right. Now let's see if we can talk to some other people. So I'm here sure. with the director, Jonathan West. And I'm here with the composer Kevin Wilt of the short film Renegade. And I just wanted to ask you guys very quick if you could comment on the collaborative uh, working relationship between composer and director for this film. You want to start off? Uh, sure. <laughs> um, when, when the film was actually being produced and edited together there, Jonathan already had some temp music in mind. So it was actually interesting because there was a certain, uh, a certain characteristic rhythm from temp music that he wanted me to maintain so using that as a starting place I was actually able to, to take that and really build that into the musical material uh, once I had a general idea of how I wanted to approach the film from scoring it from an emotional aspect I kind of ran those ideas past Jonathan and, and he seemed to, to say that we were on the same page um, and then it really wasn't too long after that until you know I, I brought him into the studio and, and we listened to um, just kind of the, a really rough mock-up of what it was going to sound like, and he signed off on it, and we re-recorded it. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. And Jonathan, when you started the film project, did you have something specific in mind for the music, or was it more um, I, uh, improvised as it went along? It's, or? Uh, it was kind of something that I totally had put into Kevin's hands. Okay. Uh, I, I knew from the very beginning, I told him I'm not very versed with music. Uh, mm -hmm. I knew what I wanted the film to be about. We actually, to date, we had the longest meeting together of any other crew or cast mm -hmm. member. Um, and that's kind of what started off the entire Renegade uh, project. And it was it was really awesome. I think it helped both of us. And mm -hmm. I knew there was the, the film that kind of, the, the, the song that was kind of the genesis of the film. And um, with what Kevin brought to it was awesome because it, it was trying to to keep the nature of the film and where it came from but it was completely a creation of of kevin's himself and uh it was beyond my expectations yeah. i knew with kevin's work before that mm -hmm. it was i was totally trusting my composer i had no worries whatsoever and it was like he said as he stepped through things it was as if he was in my mind there, mm -hmm. there were things that i couldn't describe yeah. and get across to him that I wanted to see emotionally through the music, and he was two steps ahead. He just had it all prepared. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you for a quick mini interview, and congratulations on a successfully wrapped recording session. Thank, well, thank you. you. All right. Yeah, that last one, everybody. Everybody described what beer they thought of when he played the cello an octave lower, <laughs> and all of them sounded like they wanted to drink right then. <laughs> so I thought that was good. But I didn't mean, I just thought that That's would how be... how you know the session's almost over. That, yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right, we're talking about beer, so time to go. Okay, so that was our best of streamers and punches for 2011. We'll have a lot more of those next year. Uh, next, I want to take a look at some of the, or listen, I should say, to some of the best moments of Music is Hard that I host with Tim Rosenberg. Um, if you're not familiar with the show, it's normally audio only format so if you're watching the video version of our best of show uh the video is about to get the visual is about to get a little bit boring but i think the audio more than makes up for it here's some of our best conversations uh, from 2011 exactly the other thing is that there's so much information or what whatever you want to call music there's so much music out there that you cannot digest it all 
in in a lifetime. So some music you have to understand through words. You know the the. You know, it, it, say you're not going to sit down and listen to all nine Mahler symphonies. Maybe you've listened to the first and second ones, and you can give a general description of Mahler's style, and you have an idea of what the ninth is going to sound like. But, uh, but, but you only have the words to go on at that point. And and I, you know, I say that you're never going to get through it. And some people would say, well, you you really should. Well, it's not going to happen. So get right. over it and and deal deal with the fact that you can't hear everything. You're going to miss most things. What, there's that great article around about how um, – I forgot who wrote it – about how uh, you know w- w- most of the things that are going to happen in your lifetime you're going to miss. And you have to be okay with that. And the, the, the same thing goes with music here is that you're not going to hear everything that even that you may want to hear. So you only have the words, and the words have to be uh, something meaningful and significant to convey the you know what what Mahler's Ninth Symphony may sound like to someone who's never heard it and may never hear it. Right. And I, th- you know, I think you know I, I think if we take it that seriously, then we're starting off on the right track. Hmm. I agree. But it, it's still. Um... I mean, there, there's there's always the problem of of having too much stuff and how to how to expose yourself to it because, like you said, there's uh, there's there's just too much um, it, for for even the most aggressive listener. PT Dell in the chat room says he was commenting actually on our conversation earlier about these music services um, that there's there's so much saturation that it can be hard to get to hear an individual. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, one of the things, it's something that we deal with. He's speaking uh, as as a composer, how how can an individual composer get heard? And again, like you said, not only is it important for us to be able to describe and understand other people's writings about something like Mahler, it's also really important for us to be able to describe our own music. And I think that can be even trickier because you feel so much closer to it and you know so much more about it um, that it's hard to give your, you know, elevator pitch, your 140 character synopsis of this thing that you spent months and months working on. Yeah. Um, and I don't think there's a there's a, a clear solution to that. There's not a catch all solution to that. Like like I said earlier, it depends on the audience. Um, I was interviewed for the radio a couple mm-hmm. of months ago now for a story on Michigan public radio. And, uh, the interviewer asked me to describe my music and I did a really terrible job of it. And in the the final radio piece, she made fun of me. She played a little clip of me fumbling through describing my music. Um, and she, she comes back on and she says, so he needs to work on his elevator pitch a little bit or something like that. It was like, oh, God. <laughs> Thanks, Jennifer Guerra. Yeah. It's not humiliating enough to listen to yourself speak on the radio. What right. is you being an idiot? <laughs> In my defense, I think she played possibly the worst section of what I said that of course she, she possibly did. could have. I think the source of writer's block uh and you know, I think it depends on person to person, but I think a lot of it is having a uh, a aversion to making a mistake uh, and to being uh, to making a mess or or being uh, very unorganized. Um, because I think a lot of us in the music profession have gotten to where we are because we're organized and diligent and regimented. Uh, and I think for composers or to write anything down, you have to start by just throwing some stuff at the wall um, and seeing, you know, what is good and what is going to come out of this. You have to make, uh, you know, marks on a page or or uh, make the clackety noise with your keyboard, as my favorite Merlin Clacky man clack. says. Um, you know, until until you know lines fall out, until music comes out. Uh, and you know, and it may take a while to even get started. You know, you may 
like you've said in previous episodes, you've written, you spent, you know, two or three hours writing music, most of which you know you're going to throw away, but you're doing it because, because it takes that, that little bit to get started to make something that is going to eventually become, uh, you know, a piece or whatever, whatever you're aiming for. So I think a lot of it is that, that kind of that barrier of, uh, procrastination based on uh, a fear of failure. Yeah. Do you agree with that? I think that's a big part of it, fear of failure. Um, and, I, and I think the only way really to get around that is is to realize that it's not permanent. The decisions you're making right now are not forever. And that you can come yeah, back well, tomorrow see, and change things. Yeah, but it, I, you're right. But it seems just so daunting. Like, you know... I don't compose, although you think I should. Um, and everybody in the chat room, down, tell Tim he should write music because he'd be really good oh, at it. God damn it! Don't do that. Um, uh, if if I was going to write music, I would sit down there and I would stare at that blinking cursor, and maybe I would make some gestures at writing something that was interesting. But uh, you know, it would it would be so daunting because. Uh, uh, you know, for the kind of reverence that you that I hold for music, I think music's really important and and interesting, and you know, and I I play a lot of interesting music, and my stuff will just never compare to that. So why should I even start? Um, and that's where I am. So don't end up like me, <laughs> not writing music because uh, you're too intimidated by the process of it. Um, I think and, it, there's fear, but there's another step, actually. There's two parts of it. There's the fear of failure, but there's also um, the paralysis of choices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I mean, y- y- we've all been to a restaurant and that has in- an enormous menu that has 15 things on it that all sound amazing, but you can only eat one of them, and you're just sitting there trying to figure it out. Or my, my my mom recently um, ordered a mini, a mini Cooper. Oh, okay, yeah. And you, it's 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 kind of like that. There are all these decisions you make in. You can pick colors for every little bit of the car, in, in the roof, in the car, and the stripes, and the inside door panels, and it's all they're all made to order. It's not like going to the Chevy dealership and or the BMW dealership even, and ordering uh, and buying one of the cars off the lot. They don't really keep cars on the lot. They're all made to order, hmm. and so hmm. she had to sit down for hours selecting every last little thing about this car. And it, and she's not really a decider, and it was really mm-hmm. hard for her. And and that's how I think the the same kind of thing happens in music. That th- there are even more choices in music than there are in selecting your Mini Cooper, um, because you can do anything, right? Right. You, as yeah. David Coleman yeah. says, you have to be the decider. Yeah. Oh, well, he's quoting. He's quoting President Bush. There. I, I know. Okay. You have to be the decider guy. Uh, people get mad at me when I talk about clothing. Um, I do. I get mad at you when you talk about clothing. Everybody does because I'm on the, the unpopular side of the argument here. You think I'm a rabble rouser? I'm not doing this to be a rabble rouse rouser. rabbles. I've been known to rouse a rabble in my day. Um, I mean, not You're a contrarian is what you are. No, I'm not. I yes, am, you are. Mm, you're definitely in the unpopular camp here in the clothes thing, though. I, I, will, I will go with you on that. I am. And, and um, so I will refer you to a previous uh, podcast that I was lucky enough to be on, Sound Notion 19. That's soundnotion.tv. You can find it. It's called Fashion Forward, where we talk about uh, – we were talking about alarm will sound. Actually, somebody wrote an article or something about – not wearing tuxedos, and I was on the other side of that. Um, Patrick yeah. Hulo of, of of our own flagship show, Sound Notion, does not like tuxedos, and I also do not like tuxedos. No, yeah. well, and you're wrong. Mm, sorry. Uh, so I was picking on Alarm World Sound because of how sloppy they looked, and I wrote in the comments section on that one that uh, that the thing that the trombone was wearing would not uh, allow him to enter into some Italian restaurants. 
uh, which is entirely true. And everything, every, literally everything that Eighth Blackboard wore that night falls into that category. Like if they wanted to go to the the nice Italian spot downtown after the show, you couldn't get in with what they were wearing. And here's here's what I don't like about this argument, though, Tim. Music art should not. I, I I'm okay with the barrier for entry being lower for for art. I'm okay with that. I'm not. I th- I, think, I think it should be this very very relaxed, casual thing, and nobody should feel obligated to do anything that they wouldn't ordinarily do to go experience a great performance. No, the concert is a social place where where people expect other people to act in certain ways. It's not your living room. Yeah, but they don't expect people to judge them. Yeah, like you. Yes, they do. Like no, you. they absolutely do. I don't. Well, I mean, you should go to concerts Just expecting to be judged. Doesn't mean you should assume that everyone else is. You think I'm judgmental? What? Do you think I'm judgmental? Yes. Yeah, I totally am. Um, <laughs> so, uh, okay. So, so what I said last time is, Eighth Blackbird looked like a bunch of grad students. They looked like grad students at a rehearsal, and that's what I felt they like I was like watching. Grad students in in like a caricature of graduate studentness, like in in. Jorge Cham's piled higher and deeper cartoon. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, I mean, my grad students actually dress better. Um, the it, and and I did it. Um, John asked, did it have an effect on the on the music that you heard? Of course not. Of course it didn't. Uh, you know, the, the molecules of air moving into my eardrums were, was no different. Uh, but. You know, it, it, did it did it have an effect on how I experienced their authority uh, of delivery? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, am I the only person on this side of the argument? Yeah, probably. And and do I think that Matt's vibraphone might not have malfunctioned had he been wearing uh, like a tie instead of the Under Armour shirt that he was wearing? Maybe. But you know, I think that the. I think that it has an effect on the audience, and and it has an effect on their perception of the sound. Well, you're wrong. Mm. And, and no, I, because, no, 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 no. I think I think we shouldn't even. Uh, I mean, of course, I I know that I'm right, and I can prove it. Uh, because oh yeah, yeah. Because uh, well, look at that. <laughs> look at that Joshua Bell article that everybody talks about in grad school. You know the one. Um, the yeah, the Washington Post thing. Yeah. The, the subway. Yeah. Right. 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 You know, and w- which I have major problems with, but that's more about the location than than what Joshua was wearing. But he was he was dressed up like a street busker, wearing a, a hat and a you know sweatshirt or something. But he was playing great, and nobody stopped to watch him because he he did not. Because convey... they're in a place where you don't stop. I know they're in I know. a place where you're going. Like the point of that place is to get people from one place. To, it's not a destination. Yes, but the subway station is not a destination. I understand. I understand. And that's the problem we both have with the article. But but he also did not look like he was authoritative with his delivery of one of the hardest violin pieces ever. And and that's the problem that I have. So I know you don't like it, but put on a tie, dress like an adult. No, you're absolutely wrong. How do we convince people? That they should vote for the things that are interesting and adventure. How do we? I guess maybe this, how do we convince them that these other things are interesting? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, to answer that question, I I don't know. I think it's very difficult. I think uh, that the 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 way to approach that through art or. Um, or any of the arts, you know, in terms of developing a person's taste uh, for art um, is to educate them, you know, throughout their lives, uh, having experiences with art and music and dance and so on. So you're saying that by the time these people are grown ups, there's no hope for the people that like the living statue? Well, no, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying there's no hope, but I'm saying it's much more difficult. Uh, sure. Being, I mean, you look at, uh, I mean, you look at X Factor, you know, which which we talked about, uh, or I wrote about, or I don't know, whatever, um, you know, and and how bad some of that talent is. That's you know, that's going to get votes from people 
because they like something about it. Uh, and, and you and I, um, as you know, cultured artists don't understand what it is that these people like. Um, and, and, you know, and whose fault is that? Is it, is it our fault because we're not in connection with the, the general population of the audience, you know, in America or is it Yeah, their I think fault? that's the counter argument is that, that it's not that these people are dumb. It's that we're out of touch. Right, right, right. I mean, that's the, that's always the, the problem or the argument between the two is, you know, on the one side, the consumer driven, well, this is what the public wants. They want, uh, Britney Spears, you know, they want, uh, Katy Perry. So this is what they get because, you know, they vote with their dollars for it. Right. And, um, you know, it's very, that's a very capitalist democratic kind of argument towards it. Uh, you know, which I can see, I can certainly see the merit of that. On the other hand, you and I both know that, you know, that, that Katy Perry is not the pinnacle of art uh, or music or really anything. Um, she's pretty hot, though. Got to say that. Uh, that's, that's certainly true. Right. And, uh, and there's, certain, there's certainly value in that. Yeah, let it be established. <laughs> <laughs> music is hard. Very much supports Katy Perry's physical <laughs> appearance. Um, otherwise, shh, no talking. Um <laughs> The, uh, but but how do we you know how do we change the public's mind on that how do we how do we tell them or educate them in a way uh when they're out of grade school you know when they're past the the point of getting a a general education you know what you know what's good and what's not good and uh you know the answer to that i think is very difficult you know i don't right i don't i'm not sure but i, I feel like there has to be something other than art prize Sure. Right. Yeah. It, something like Art Prize gets everybody excited to go see this thing, right? And it's the only time during the whole year that they see any art. Mm-hmm. Um, and the same is true of music. the The only time anybody sees the the music that that we don't like, um, they're not seeing any. I mean, they, there's never the opportunity for them to see anything other than what they like. There's kind of a, a feedback loop, right? Right, right, right. I I agree, and I think that that it, you know it does fall on onto the music makers to uh, you know to to push off consumerism in that way and to advance the art farther than the audience has ever been before. Uh, and and you see this from time to time. You see it in Radiohead, where they you know they. They said we're not going to be rock and roll anymore. We're going to do something different, and their audience loves them for that. Right? Um, you know, but they have a smaller well, audience. Well, yeah, right, I think right. they lost a lot of their audience. They sure did, and and they they continue to have a smaller and smaller audience than you know uh, any of your you know your big rock band, Nickelback or whatever. You know, some terrible rock band. Um, you know, the, their Nickelback is not doing what Radiohead does, but. You know, uh, Radiohead's doing more art, or you know, things that that you and I would consider more artistic. And um, so it's it's great to like lament that this stuff isn't happening. Mm-hmm. But let's say you were having a conversation with one of these guys that's that's giggling about this this flute piece that you talked about at the beginning of the show. What do you tell him? Man, that's tough. Uh, I you know. I I think that you uh you know you, you kind of have to experience that once before you you understand it. So maybe the next time they have they you know maybe the, the next piece they see is the Barrio trombone sequenza uh and and they don't laugh as much even though it's funny. Uh you know it's is it maybe you know maybe the, they've learned now that oh this is this is really art because by the end of the piece um you know things got pretty serious is about this you know the, the classic harlequin character um and you know and he it got it got a little bit serious as the piece went on and the laughter went down more and more because he was he's kind of this hysterical uh clownish type of character and people are shocked and they giggle at first and then they're like, whoa, 
whoa, you know, this is this is Jack Nicholson in The Shining. This is, you know, this isn't funny anymore. It's really creepy. Um, so, you know, I think they learned right there in the in the concert. Um, you know, so maybe the next time they're they're a little more equipped. Uh, you know, what do I tell them on how to understand that better? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I just said it, but you know, it. You know, other than saying like the classic, you know, that's not funny. This, you know, this is not humor. This, it's not, it's not a joke. You it know, it's really be. serious. Well, it, it could, could be. be funny. It could be funny, but I, that definitely wasn't the point at this in this piece. At least I don't think so. So that was some of our favorite moments of music is hard, if we do say so ourselves. Now we're going to give uh, the floor over to the best clips from Sound Notion from this year. Uh, we have found that our favorite moments of Sound Notion have all involved our guests, which is uh, maybe doesn't say so, much, so many good things about us, but I think it says some great things about the quality of guests that we're able to get on this show. Um, so all of these clips are going to be clips from some of the great people that we've had the opportunity to talk to. Um, and I want to give a special thanks to the, the first couple of people you're going to see, Mirna Shim uh, and Drew McManus. Mirna and Drew were on the show, I think, on episodes 7 and 9. So we had just started out, and they uh, went out on a limb and came on our silly little show uh, via Skype. Um, so we want to really thank Mirne and Drew, but of course, thanks to all of our guests and uh, thanks to everyone who has made uh, Sound Notion and Sound Notion TV a success this year. And I'll, I'll, I'll drop a little bit more of that even after these clips, but you're going to see a lot of people in rapid succession. Um, they'll have names in the video, but if you're listening to the audio, you're going to hear Mirne Shim, Drew McManus, Molly Sheridan, Du Yun, Drew McManus again, Missy Mazzoli, Chris Schultes, Daniel Felsenfeld, Ken Ueno, David Smook, uh, Rob Deemer, Chris Richardson, Alan Pearson, and Alex Ross. Um, so thanks so much to all of you. If if uh, you happen to be listening to the show or watching the show and you were one of the, the guests, many guests that we had that didn't make our best of show, uh, I sincerely apologize. No offense intended. Um, we... we didn't want to make this a seven hour best of show. Um, I, I certainly think we could have, um, but enjoy some of our, our best guest appearances from sound notion for the year 2011. <laughs> <laughs> to me, that's, that's just as ridiculous. I mean, that's like uh, talking yeah, I, about I, what I, Justin Bieber wore on the Grammys. It has as much validity to new music as that. Well, I, I mean, but are you offended by something like no. that? No. It's ridiculous well, to be offended. I by don't it. know. I mean, you're talking about like tweens do care what Justin Bieber wore, and that's like fought his fodder for his Twitter feed and and his you know like you got one of you guys said you know good off you know publicity publicity is good publicity. Yeah. In some ways, um, this is it, it is ridiculous. I mean, I <laughs> I did read that new, uh, new music box article. Um, I didn't go to the website with a G spot, but <laughs> I um, did read about it and Sound I find it's, that it's hard to, to be... it's hard to convince yourself to click on a link that says G spot. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it was it's ridiculous, but also I don't know. I guess if you have if it's just a headshot or something, I mean. What can you do? Like people will do stupid things. You just let them do it. But then, but then again, if you're in a photo shoot with wearing nothing but your cello or something, mm -hmm. yeah, um, what cute. what kind of thing are you trying to sell? I mean, I'm not. I don't care if they if artists want to do that. You know, that's totally their prerogative, and I have nothing. I've seen nothing wrong with it except. You shouldn't be offended if you end up on the G spot. Right. If you're if you're wearing nothing but your clarinet, you know. Yeah. yeah. Right. I just you showed they're still in the community, they're still working, and that's the real value of having a resident orchestra as opposed to uh, something like a residency orchestra, is you get to have the benefit of having the professional musicians in the community who live there, work there, teach lessons, do all the extracurricular artistic activity that they do. That's what builds the local musical culture. Um, and in the DSO's case, I'm certainly not saying at all that they're not raising any money. I mean, they're out there working they're getting money coming in. It's just the clarity of the numbers that they've explained 
hasn't been presented at a level that doesn't answer as many questions as it asks. Right. Right. Um, you mentioned all the orchestras that were actually doing pretty well. Do you think that there's a common thread that you can spin through all of those that holds them together for why they're having some success? Absolutely. Um, it's a stakeholder relationship. Um, there's trust um, between one another. I'll take Nashville because that's really one of my favorite orchestras to point at in the last decade that's done such a great job at coming back from what would normally be a basket case scenario because they, they filed reorganization bankruptcy as well. And in the period of 20 years after that, because of, uh, I really think, the executive that they have in place, Alan Valentine, who I can't say enough good things about, um, the relationship of trust that he built with the musicians was uh, at a necessary level that allowed the board to do the things that they need to do, the musicians the things they need to do, and that everyone became unified behind a single vision that was centered around growth and maximizing local potential without placing artificial limitations on one another. Right. Um, you might be familiar that Meet the Composer has a studio aspect of their media operation that they've launched. Um, it's sort of a little bit akin to something like a Kickstarter or an artist share, where they're online really documenting a few of the projects that they have supported, allowing the composers to you know talk with their constituencies and put up videos and follow the process as pieces are created. So that's, that's coming out from the composer side. That's supporting the, the work as it's being created going out. From our side, New Music Box, Counterstream Radio, we're going the other way and like increasing and fine-tuning our coverage of all activities. That won't suddenly be just restricted to what Meet the Composer is doing. We will continue as a, a sort of um, in, journalistically independent organization. So as we relaunch the site, broaden what we're able to do, we're looking to bring on a, a couple of regional editors, um, we have some other plans that are, you know, still in the nascent stages, but we're going to, like, be working on developing that side of it and then meet the composers developing its side of how they chronicle the projects that they support. Okay. So I'm curious, uh, what are some projects that um, are going to be w available to to this new organization, to New Music USA, that they'll be capable of doing that – these uh, constituent organizations now are not capable of doing on their own. So what what are are we going to get new from having these these resources pooled? Um, well, I'm sure there's just an under underlying structural, financial, economic reality that sure. this is going to help us, you know, band together. But I am I am not on the on the finance department, so I'm just thinking of it simply as you know, like I said, these meetings that we just sat down couple colleagues on the Meet the Composer side. We're a small staff as well, the media department. So when the two of us, even just to get together, the brain power and the technological expertise and the intellectual curiosity and everything that they bring to the table, right there, that just expands what we can do and the people that we, are, we have contact to. I mean, so much of this industry, in my experience, has been being able to link up with other people because of who you know, and what music you're interested in and that like continually opening doors for you to new things that are exciting and that just that ups the ante a little bit for us in that in that way as well okay right. it's, it's 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 geared towards um uh the s lab that we are launching which oh, okay. is uh, uh which is actually it's really quite yeah you know how sometimes um ensemble has the saying that uh, you know you get have a composer writing or commission composer writing for for, for ensembles and what's going to happen is that most of the time as you know people i mean you guys all would know is that composer sit at a home and just compose and then show up um your scores to the ensemble maybe like a week before if you're lucky and work <laughs> with uh, uh, uh ensembles and and then have a 40 uh, concert and the, the idea, the concept of uh, Ice Lab is a little bit different. Um, we, we wanted to nurture the composers along um, the commission process. Um, mm. So that, you know, beginning of the, the commissioning, you know, already you have this sort of like a lab, which means that you get together with um, a, a, a musicians and you try different sounds and then that will um, influence influence your your, your comp com composing process, and then you go home, and then a couple months later we do that again, and you know so to really cultivate some com uh, some some piece that is very 
uh, much geared towards this collaborative process. By collaborative, I don't mean we write things together, but I do mean that it's very much a, of a barrier sequences writing, that kind of spirit, you know, that, that mm. those pieces cannot be written without those um, input from the, the musicians. Yeah. And, those individuals, uh, for instance, right? Exactly. For instance, like Nathan Davis, that uh, one of the current uh, Ice Lab composers, he right. wrote, he's written a couple pieces that were very, very specified for musicians in the ensemble. Yeah. Pieces cannot be written otherwise, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's not, yeah. a, it's not like a piece that you, you work on for a year and then turn out. Had Drew on uh, to talk about the problems with orchestras. This wasn't on the list, but <laughs> I think to lighten the mood, we should talk about the Toronto <laughs> Symphony. Yeah, I feel and bad. We always have Drew on when we're talking about stuff that's gloom, going terrible, terribly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we well, use the word solve the problems to get someplace good. We yeah, use the words right. untenable and intractable a lot when Drew's on. <laughs> <laughs> and bankruptcy. And bankruptcy, <laughs> yes. Uh, well, Toronto's so, a great so, situation, yeah. Um, their yeah. sound check program, which has been focusing on the 35 and under crowd, and they've been putting a, a lot of effort into this program for at least, if not close to, at least a decade. Yeah, I started they were... following their sound check program back in, I think, 2003, 2004. And they had a very active program that at that time was pre Facebook, remember? Yeah. Right. Uh, and they had a very active discussion board where they had regular staff members that were interacting with the under 35 crowd patrons, which really had a good range from you know the teenage crowd through the 20 to early 30 somethings. Uh, and that's been a process to build over the years, which is important to note. But they're 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 starting to reap the rewards from all of that by putting a consistent long term effort into that process. Right. Yeah. And it's as late as 2001, according to this article, they were suffering from near bankruptcy is the way it's described. Okay. So since since then, you know, they seem to. And uh, it's funny, you know, how do you get to 18 to 35 crowd? You offer them special ticket prices. Uh, that's a you know, that's a shocker. Um, to, to me, it's like all the stuff that we say would work is like what. <laughs> the Toronto Symphony is doing, engaging the public, using new media, offering shorter concerts. Um, the whole tailgating thing to me sounds interesting. Uh, I mean, like yeah. I've always wanted to tailgate at a classical concert. Well, imagine like, this: bring my like, little barbecue, like the way people tailgate football, like bring a little barbecue grill and you yeah. know actually tailgate and have beer in the parking lot. Well, imagine you're yeah. 26 years old and you've got a date and you want to do something cool and sort of you know off the beaten path tailgating for a, a symphony concert sounds like a really cool idea to me if if they make it cool so you know instituting all these plans is only going to work if the person that's sort of running it knows how to make it cool right well <laughs> and apparently that. they do and the other really key point here that i think needs to be pointed out is the longevity of this program uh is only going to result from having a person that's vested into it from the organization there for that stretch of time. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys have ever talked about it before, but one of the key problems on the administrative side of the orchestra field is turnover. You've talked about it on the show. Well, there we go. There you uh, go. <laughs> and, and I've heard that you're an expert. So bad. Well, turnover is so bad in these cases that even if you have someone who does everything right, they're not there long enough to see it through to maturity to where it starts right. producing the kind of results like you're seeing in Toronto. And there are all sorts of reasons why that needs to change on the administrative side. And orchestra administrations need to be better places to work. Um, they don't focus enough now on creating a worthwhile work environment. They don't do workplace satisfaction surveys. Of course, pay is an issue, but that's all around. You can still create a work environment that's going to be productive, uplifting, and someplace that people want to become vested and stay for a long period of time as opposed to the pressure-filled, low-return uh, environments that exist right now. So that's the first step in, be able to, in being able to put a program like this in place, because the, the wider picture with, with uh, Toronto is this is not the first group that's attempted to do something like this. Um, there have been other groups that have even taken the same name, Soundcheck, um, and put their own programs into place, but they haven't had the sort of longevity that 
Toronto has had, and they haven't made the conscious decision to allocate those resources toward the program to be able to see the kind of results that come in. Everyone wants the silver bullet solution to get something that will increase everything now. Right. But if only there was some kind of website that would av advertise orchestra business jobs <laughs> to help the orchestras find <laughs> best available talent. Yes. Well, it's funny you mentioned that. There is one at Adaptation <laughs> Jobs where anyone can post a job at an orchestra administration position free of charge, plus people can browse free of charge and apply for the position right online. Nice. Well, you know, that's great. <laughs> um, and I guess all the, well, the pieces on our album, um, Cathedral City, are all really in like the five to seven minute mm -hmm. range. So it's on the shorter side, I guess, of my output. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I feel like that was sort of, but the, the thing about it is that I conceived of that album as a sort of symphony. I, I conceived of all the, of these eight yeah. pieces that would go together from beginning to end. Um, and it sort of is one big piece that addresses similar things that come back, um, and themes that come back again and again, and and the pr the placement of the electronics is very uh, particular. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that I I don't know in terms of length. I don't. So I don't think in terms of length that well, not, not band, just length, but I mean, how how in general has has your experience with the band influenced the music that you're writing? Yeah, well, the band is great because it's, you know, four of my best friends um, and we get together in a room and we can play through stuff that fails spectacularly, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's not happening in front of anybody. It's happening like in my living room and they'll tell me if something's not working and we'll work some th things out together. So in that sense, it's been very liberating and I've, I've been able to expand my sort of sonic palette um, because of the band in very significant ways. And it's also just sort of, um, comforting and reassuring that, you know, to have this sort of space where I can do whatever I want. And it's um, allowed me to be a lot more experimental and free and intuitive in all of my work. Because I know that even if I never get another commission, I will still have this band and I can still get them together and make music. Yeah. Um, and it's not dependent on the economy or other people or style or what's in vogue. Like, I will just always be able to bring people together and make music in a room. <laughs> I think that every person should have that. Yeah. Well, it's, 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 it's kind of hard to, um, it's, it, it's, it's funny because the, the more of a composer I become and the less of the teacher I become, uh, the harder it is to talk about my music. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm spending a lot more time writing now and a lot less time talking about writing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess that goes back to the earlier subject. But let me just say, uh, in order to stay away from that subject and go on to this one, which is in, in my own music, uh, that, that I was thinking about form a lot. And, uh, and, and one of the things I was trying to do um, as I was thinking about form is not let it influence what I wrote very much. Um, uh, one of the things that 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 uh, that I remember writing at, at the same time that I was uh, composing the piece was was a concern that I had about listening and and, um, and so when I when I wrote uh, the sketches for the piece I, I did a lot of I did a lot of time walking in um, in, a, in in one specific location in the Manzano Mountain wilderness in, in New Mexico. And so all of my sketches got written in, in these, these, these notebooks that you can see here. And, mm -hmm. and then when I went back to uh, actually write the piece down and, and notate it, I, I, used those, I used those sketches and, and in a very you know, traditional way, sat at a piano and, 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 and hammered out the piece. Um, but when, I, when, I, when, when you talk about form, let me just say this. I, I thought of the piece in its entirety as, as, as almost like a 5-1 cadence. It starts at B-flat, at the, the very first note of the piece, the first movement is a B-flat in, in, in uh, crotales and, and flute, and then, uh, and then the last movement, is, 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 as you know, if you've heard it, is, is, um, is, is, is going from that B-flat into, into E-flat major and Granger-esque type uh, uh, Final, final, final movement uh, called the ear, and um, 
and how you how I got from that place from the first note to the to 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 the to the last movement uh, was really something that I think is 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 fairly closely connected to how I walk. What I what I do when I walk is is I start off um, like probably everybody does uh, with with uh, a mind full of of ideas and and thoughts and and. Uh, and then when I get to the point where the walk begins to work for me creatively, those, those thoughts are gone. You, you get exhausted. Sam knows that he's taken some of these walks with me. And, uh, and, and the physical exhaustion that's, that's, that's involved with uh, walking for more than three, four hours uh, eventually makes it almost impossible to, to really think. Um, and instead, uh, you get empty. And, and I would say that, that that was maybe the thing that influenced me the most when I started thinking about the form of the piece is how, how it could stay formally empty. And, and I think if you're hearing it sectionalized in the way that you're talking about, Sam, uh, uh, then that means that I, I might have succeeded at that because it means that maybe, maybe in terms of trying to find out what's the overall shape of the piece, it might be really difficult to do. Um, but there are, there are things that, as you may have also noticed, connect the movements and they tend to be, they tend to be maybe more motivic. Uh, yes. or, or pitch oriented so things come back uh, uh, and, and, and when you get to the end the, the, the last movement I think is the, the biggest puzzle is how did, how did we get here you know, how did I get to this, this, this E flat major chord uh, and that I, that I really can't tell you and, and, uh, and, and I, just, I just knew uh, in, in each of those instances as I was writing each movement and I wrote them in order uh, you know, one, two, three, and four, just, 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 just worked out that way. Um, is I just knew what to do from moment to moment. I knew that I go from here to here to here. And, and I didn't have any overall shape when I started to write the piece, except that I knew it was going to start at B flat and end at B flat. I wish um, I could tell you more than that, but that's about, <laughs> that's about it in terms of the form of the piece. <laughs> Other than it has one, I think we would agree, but how, how, it, how it came to be is, is really kind of a mystery even to me. I've been thinking for a long time about, you know, I, I, I was I was a, a couple of blocks away on 9/11 uh, from where it all happened, uh, and I was staying in the apartment of my friend Eleanor Sandresky, and I had to flee, and I was I literally like walked into a cloud of ash, and you know, so I had a very personal, immediate experience with this, like so many New Yorkers did, and. Wow. You know, I remember a year later, all the tributes and I, you know, all the, 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 you know, everybody's like screaming, where's the Guernica for this and all the people reacting. And I, and I, I think I kept thinking, what would be the best reaction we could have to this? And the only thing I could think of was, what if we just found composers or songwriters who were there or who lived there and who were just immediately affected and just do something of theirs? Not even on theme. It didn't have to be about 9-11. It has to be of no particular mood. Just say this person, myself, for example, was there and this is their music. And, um, and, and of course this would have to be a really, really long concert. And of course you actually couldn't do it because you couldn't possibly represent everybody that was there. But it would give you this amazing cross-section of what like what we consider a lot of the the world's new music community, how immediately affected they were by this thing. And I, you know, I, I don't want, I don't want serenities. I don't want memorials or lists of names or politics or anything like that. I just, I just wanted the music. And, and, and <clears throat> when, um, when, when there were those, those telethons were happening for Haiti. Um, uh -huh. And I remember everybody was singing mournful song after mournful song to try to raise some money and g good on them. Seriously, and I remember Wycliffe coming out and 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 saying basically, enough of this moping. Let's show them what we do, mm -hmm. and I, that's kind of what I think this concert is. Is it's like this is what we do, you know? We're still here. Everybody who is in every composer of the fifty-three, I think, composers or songwriters we're representing, uh, is is still alive and still composing ostensibly, and and you know like. This is more of a celebration of the fact that 10 years has gone by and that is still happening. And that to me was the most important way to do it and to, to make it free um, and to make it f 
free from foundational support uh, because, you know, foundations or big organizations get their snout in it and, that, and you know, free of advertising, free of politics. <clears throat> Just basically it's a gift uh, as a member of the New York music community that myself and my co-producer, Eleanor Sandreski, uh, whose apartment I was in that day, wanted to give to ourselves and to all, anybody who wants to come. That's, yeah. that, that's music after in a nutshell. Cool. Every uh, year on, on 9-11, and like I said, I had a particularly close experience, and every year it's a frustrating day, and every year it's a lot to think about. And I'm, I am by no means alone. In fact, I am spending untold hours assembling a concert of just a small sliver of a small sliver of a small sliver who have a similar story to mine. Um, <clears throat> and every year I just wish I had somewhere interesting to go where I knew people. I, you know, like, I, I, I don't, I'm not going to go down to the, the, the site with, with the na lists of names and the president. And I, I, I don't want to do that. And I'm not religious, so I don't want to go to church. And, I, I, and every year I try to do something, and every year it just totally fails. And so I, I thought, well, for the 10-year anniversary, why don't we at least have a place where people can kind of, it's free and you can come and go. And you know, where, where my community, the people that are my family, I, I feel like, you know, a lot of the music that's been written about 9-11 has been in, in some kind of weird attempt to offer a uh, some kind of cathedral in which to contemplate 9-11. Yes. And for those of us who are here, we need no excuse. We need not to contemplate it. It, right. it, it is something that's there. We have contemplated it. What we need is just like, you know, some music, I think. It's actually interesting that you said cathedral because what I was thinking when you were talking was catharsis, which is sort of similar in this context. People are trying to write a piece that's some sort of cathartic moment where we collectively deal with what happened. But I think more than anything else, time heals. You know, we move on, we keep composing music, and we keep coming together. So, congratulations. Well, that's that 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 is the idea, and I and I hate to sound like a California hippie when I say the word healing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a word I use only when, you know, like my leg feels better, but <laughs> it, is, it is hope. I mean, look, I, those of us, nobody's going to ever be okay after that. It changed everything. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we can talk about 9-11, but I, I, I wanted a concert that was not about 9-11, but was about the people that were affected. And it's not portraits in grief. It's not about the dead people. It's not Requiem. And I, again, people have have their right to figure this out in the way they need to figure it out. And I have my right to think that's in excellent taste or that is in not excellent taste. And I, I'm, in a weird way, the worst person to judge any kind of 9-11 related art because I can't get past, you know, the, the, the I mean, I know the smell of 9-11 and, and, and it's, a, it's difficult once you know that to, to, to hear somebody's serenity and think, okay, I know you were deeply moved and I know you meant this, but come on, you know? So what, so what we wanted to do was to get the composers and ask them what they wanted to do. As a composer, I'm, I think I mainly respond to myself as a listener. <laughs> and I think I'm, uh, you gotta be a fan. At least what drives me um, to be a, a music maker is how much I love listening to music. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the main artist, the main, the biggest inspiration I had in my life to first become a, a musician was Jimi Hendrix. And then uh, after I got into Jimi Hendrix, I, 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 then I heard some contemporary music, um, 20th century, no longer contemporary, Bartok Stravinsky, and then some contemporary music. And that's how I wanted to become a, a composer by getting to know that music. But first of, and foremost, wanting to become an electric guitarist and a musician was Jimi Hendrix. Mm -hmm. And then I thought about like things like the opening, the introduction to the Monterey Pop performance of Wild Thing, and it's just like feedback and just, he's reinventing the guitar. It's no longer tracking the, the fundamental as the main, you know, the melody or the foreground. It's, it's the stuff above it. It's the noise, the feedback, the, the spectrum of sound. It's frequency based. And so that's one influence that I still think about, a more a complex spectrum of, of harmony. But then, uh, um, right before he starts going into the song proper, he plays the open strings and he's 
he's out of tune, you know? And then I thought, like, <laughs> well, if I, if I were, if this guy, <laughs> Jimi Hendrix, were in the Nuremberg, you know, chamber, con you know, competition or something like that, and I'm judging this, he'd fail, you know? The main, you know, the normative means, the normative means of assessing classical performance, right? And you apply that to this performance, it, it's, you know. But on the other hand, I said, what makes this an iconic moment? He, it's so famous and it's so powerful, you know. And I felt like, okay, in all of the listening of the blues or, you know, our, our basic fandom listening, you know, when we listen to our favorite uh, musicians, uh, especially in pop, see, I propose that there, we're, we're engaging with some sort of communion with the aura of that artist. And in some way, for me, that kind of listening is not so, so you know, dissimilar from when I pick up the phone, I can recognize as my mom with her just saying hello. And beyond that, when she says hello, I can often tell what mood she's in, you know? There's some very complex modes of listening going on. And, and I, that, that sense of the aura, something about that specific person that you're engaging with in that kind of dialogue as a listener, I, I'm investigating that. In, in some way, and trying to transcribe that as, as a compositional or curate that in, in compositions. And um, so I like to collaborate with people who, you know, I, I admire as human beings, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in some sort of way, I'm trying to honor and, and transcribe their essence as that makes them remarkable human beings into the piece in some sort of way. That's the main attraction for me. Uh, in writing person-specific music. Yeah. Um, I, normally with, with these, I try to just, you know, be as clear as possible and just present everything, but I, I do have to admit to um, a little bit of provocation on this one. Uh, <laughs> I, I definitely wrote that first paragraph to be a little mean. Um, I wanted to see if I could get a rise out of people in part because... I think really what that is, what that article is about is it's, you know, I mean, I, I get frustrated. I get very frustrated at times because I, I think that just, that it, just as modernism kind of replaced the idea of this is all good music and there should be a place for our good music with all music should be like what I'm writing. I think that there's a reactionary movement that's, saying modernism was bad and everyone should write music like what I'm writing. And I think either way, it's just, I, and it's actually, I think it's kind of evil to, you know, and, and so the large point of the article is really to just let everyone write what they want to write and listen to it and accept the fact that every listener has their own aesthetic and, as, and that we should just allow every listener to find the music that speaks to them. And instead of telling people, oh, they should write modernist music or, oh, they should write gentle music, just say, oh, you like gentle music? You might really dig this composer. You like crunchy music? You might really dig this other composer. And yeah. so that's really what I'm going after. I think that, to me, is the, is the most interesting part of your article, is, is that you present the people that feel like they should be writing and everybody should be writing um, kind of what the audience wants to hear and what's easy to comprehend in, in, in one sitting, uh, it, you, you kind of describe that as exactly as unhelpfully dogmatic as the, the modernist dogma, uh, which I think is an interesting thing. I had never compared the two that way in my head before. Yeah, and I think that's exactly, I think that, you know, I understand it. As a human, I understand why, you know, why when you've, been dealing with this one dogma for 50 years, why you would feel pushed down by it and feel like you have to push against it. But I think, I think our generation, you know, my generation and your generation, that we're beyond those arguments. We can be beyond those arguments. Do you I think, think so. though that there's, uh, sure, go ahead, Patrick. I just want to say, I'm, I completely agree. Like for our generation, I think we're well beyond the argument about, you know, you should be listening to this sort of music or, you know, certain music should be given prevalence in the concert setting, one or the other. 
Um, like I don't, I don't care about those sorts of things myself personally. Yeah, and personally, I, my favorite concerts are often the ones where I go there. And um, when Augusta Reed Thomas used to curate the Music Now series in Chicago, when I was living in Chicago, she would always make sure that the concerts would have, you know, um, oh, I mean, I'm trying to think of, of specific examples. Like it was like the first Philippe Arell performance in Chicago ever. And I think that that was paired with George Walker. You know, and, and it's okay. You know, these are really opposite dynamics, but at the same, you know, and so the audience would always leave the concert and everyone would be like, oh yeah, there was one piece that I just absolutely loved and I hated all the others. And then you'd realize that everyone was talking about a different piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Do, you, yeah. do you think though that there is, is there anything at all that we can say objectively about a piece of music? Uh, we've talked about this before. I, I feel like, I want there to be something objective that we can say about music because I, you know, went to school to learn how to do something objectively better, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and do, you, do you think there is something we can say that's independent I, of that? Absolutely, Dave. And I think that's a great place to take this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I, I think you've hit on, I think you've hit the, the nail on the head where, on the one hand, you want people to have the room to enjoy the music they want to enjoy, but on the other hand, there are there there are things that you can say. This is a successful composition. This is not a successful composition. And one of the but one of the easiest things you can do for that is say, you know, talk to a composer afterwards and say, you know, what were you trying to express from that? You know, what what was what what was your goal? And then if you're, you know, if they're saying, oh, yeah, that was all about my deep, dark experience when, um, when, when I almost committed suicide when I was 16 and it was just a brutal time of my life and you're, and you're listening to peace and you're thinking it's all about butterflies, then I think you can say that's a pretty unsuccessful piece. Right. Unless you hate butterflies. The whole, I, the whole thing that came back to it was the idea, it, what got me thinking about the ideas of amateurs in composition uh, was this talk that I had a roundtable discussion that I was going to be doing at um, uh, Bowling Green in a, in a couple days before I, I wrote the piece. And the idea of why are we, why do we need to be teaching kids before college uh, who may not even want to go into composition as a career, why would we be interested in teaching them composition? And so I, I kind of wanted to explore the idea of we don't necessarily have to teach composition in order to create professional composers. So that's what kind of got me thinking in terms of, all right, well, why don't we really see as many uh, folks uh, writing piano music, writing string quartets? It doesn't necessarily mean you know, writing an opera, writing a symphony, uh, but just composing as a pastime uh, rather than... Uh, you know, going off and saying, I'm going to be a composer with a big C and that's what I'm going to do with my life. Um, so that, that's, that's kind of what got me thinking in terms of, of um, asking those questions. I really wasn't sure, you know, and, and of course these, these days um, there are so many different op opinions in terms of exactly, well, what is a professional and what is a composer? You know, how, how to be able to nail that down is, is very difficult. Right. Right. Well, if if anybody on our panel has opinions, <laughs> it's Sam Rasiris. It's Sam Rasiris. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> no, and it was it was actually very very cool to uh, uh, you know I I saw that you guys were talking about it last week, and so I was sitting in my office, I was watching this thing, and I'm going, wow, okay, cool, this is fun. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what the hell was he thinking? <laughs> Hopefully, we weren't too mean. Oh no no not at all. <laughs> Well, I mean, but that's that's the type that's the thing, especially when you bring in a term such as amateur, because it has a hell of a lot of baggage to it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of uh, folks these days who really, you know, equate amateurism with being something that, uh, you know, you don't know what you're doing, and so when you when you call someone amateur, it's it's basically uh, a not a very good thing to do these days. Although mm -hmm. in the past. You know, the idea of being an amateur at something was not necessarily a derogatory term. It was just something, well, you did your job, and then you did something else on the side that you really enjoyed as a pastime. 
Um, and I'm wondering whether or not we can get back to that at some point, if we ever had it in the first place. Perhaps so, avocation would be a little less uh, oh, pejorative. Yeah. Yep, yep. So, Rob, are you are you thinking more specifically um, for things like you mentioned, string quartets, um, you know, works for solo instrument or something like that? This is the this is the kind of composition that you're really focusing on. When I was thinking of composition, I was I was really in my head. I was thinking writing notes down and writing for performers uh, as opposed to you know working in garage band or 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 doing. Uh, your own elect electroacoustic or electronic music, um, where, hmm, how's the best way to put it? It's basically, you know, it's 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 using the craft of composition, not necessarily to the nth degree, um, you know, high end serialism or spectralism or anything like that, but basically just composing uh, with pencil and paper or a notation program and uh, and getting folks to to play it, not to make money but just for the enjoyment of it even if it's just for yourself to play yeah uh, well i mean my perspective is informed by really just a profound narcissism and that's <laughs> um, I, I have no musical training i i am not a composer or a musician you know i played in a rock band when i was younger and th that's what i listened to uh i was working at a venue in chicago that Ace blackbird was playing at and I remember the night, because it was one of those, you know, when you work at a theater, you get burnt out on the art pretty quickly, because you, you work all day, and then you go to shows all night, every night. And it was one of those nights where Ace Blackbird was playing, and everyone was telling me I should really check him out, and I was, I was just tired, and finally convinced myself to stay, and then just absolutely fell in love with, with what they did. And it reminded me so much of a kind of indie rock band, and just in that their personalities were foregrounded, they were younger, um, there was just this kind of a, a vitality, a ferocity with what they were doing on stage. And I became an instant fan. So I always think, you know, if people like me who don't have that formal musical training can become a fan of Ace Blackbird, then, then you know, there's, there's plenty more out there. Because, I mean, that's one of the big barriers to entry to our field is there's this sense that you have to know music in order to understand and appreciate contemporary work. You know, anyone will go to a new theater production, uh, even a new art opening, because there's this sense that even if you don't have that formal training, you know, as a human, as an educated citizen of the world, you can understand enough of it to appreciate it, uh, to enjoy it, to critically engage with it. That's not the case in music. People think that if they don't have that training, it's just going to go right over their head and they get anxious and they don't know when they should clap. They don't know if it's good or not. Uh, I mean, we even had a question last night where one of the audience members asked how many mistakes the band made on stage last night. <laughs> <laughs> like they wanted to count, but they made a good point because with contemporary music, you don't know if it's being performed well. It's, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, at times. Well, at times, yeah. I, I, I mean, my perspective is informed by, you know, by Ace Blackbird. But I do often sure. joke that you know, we, we get these great <laughs> reviews all the time, which I'm, I'm obviously very grateful for. Yeah. But I sometimes wonder, you know, th this is the first time these critics are ever hearing this piece of music. <laughs> what do they have to yeah. compare it to? Right. It's, it's a different threshold for critique than yeah. more traditional repertoire. Well, one, one of the things you mentioned just now is I think one of the, to me, more compelling things about Ace Blackbird is how personable and relatable they are in, in performance mm -hmm. they, they they don't seem you know when you go see a very traditional string quartet performance there's this barrier between you and the performers and something about their stage presence is is much more inviting than i think a lot of people are used to in, in classical music especially oh, absolutely. chamber music in terms of performance aesthetic it's much more informed than, than by the, a classical tradition I mean, you know, people sometimes ask, like, why, uh, why classical music, well, classical musicians wear tuxedos on stage? And if you, you know, look it up historically, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's because they were always seen as servants. I yes. mean, they were part of the, the servant class. They were there to, you know, do their job and just play the music and make a, a beautiful um, sound. In there. <coughs> and then so, bring you a drink afterward as well. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so it's 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 a it's a totally different model. Um, the the orchestral world is still. I mean, obviously, the the, the class, um, the place of the musicians within the society has changed, but there's still that sense of they're just there to be servants of. If there's any kind of allowance for you know individual genius or personality, it's with the conductor, with the composer, uh, but not the musicians. Uh, right. With chamber music, with contemporary music in general, that's being shifted. 
and I think largely because of uh, the pop world. Um, yeah. You know, these are musicians, they're, you know, we're all in our 30s. You know, we grew up on MTV where music is visual, uh, where we were, you know, listening to, to rock and pop music right alongside uh, the classical training, and those things have just blended in a really natural way by this point. Yeah. Yeah. So I warned you guys I was going to talk on. <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. And, 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 and the main reason I brought that up was exactly what you mentioned with uh, what, what, eighth blackbird wears when they perform um <laughs> are we gonna go back there i don't want to i don't want to go back there but so I, I tim tim would be mad at me if i didn't bring it up uh <laughs> if, if you don't know i i host another show on soundnotion.tv with tim rosenberg music is hard and i don't know how we got into it but we spent a good 20 minutes one week talking about what eighth blackbird wears when they perform right that was so and fascinating <laughs> You and Tim, Tim have, like, the exact opposite views on that. <laughs> well, I think Tim and everybody in the world has the exact opposite <laughs> views on that. That's I'm sure he'd say it. the same. Yeah. It's fun to watch you guys duke it out. Well, he can he can yell at me on this Thursday. Or, well, I guess we're not doing it this week because of Thanksgiving. But I don't completely disagree with him. I, I mean, I do think – I mean, I'm someone who – you know, I, I'm one of these crotchety people that complains about what kids wear in public. Um, <laughs> I would never it's be caught nice dead days. in sweatpants, you know, anywhere outside of like a two foot radius of my bed. Right. right. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, like, I wouldn't feel comfortable wearing what Tim wears on stage, Tim Monroe from Eighth Blackbird. Right. Uh, but it's it's an authentic indication of his style, of his physical comfort. And I, I think we urge all the members to dress in a way that's respectful of the audience and that they feel, um, you know, dignified and that they feel appropriately, you know, classed up and comfortable. And so it varies with the musicians. Right. Uh, but on the, I mean, I think I mentioned this uh, in a comment on one of the blog posts, but I'll never forget being down at the ASO, the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, <laughs> when we were premiering the, the concerto by Jennifer Higdon on a wire. Mm -hmm. And so the first piece had been done, I think the Gandolfini, and then the stagehands came out to set up the piano for the Blackbird piece because it starts with them actually playing inside the piano uh, with, with bows. And so the stagehands set up the piano, then leave, and then Eighth Blackbird comes out, and our percussionist, Matthew Duvall, is the first one coming out. And Matthew of the group is actually the most casual. I'm surprised Tim picked on Tim rather than Matthew because Matthew just wears T-shirts and he's a bulky guy. Like, I mean, he's a big guy. He's been carrying percussion for, you know, 20 years. Right. right. And as he comes out, I um, mean, he's the first in the line. I, the couple in front of me, who we haven't talked to yet, and they're, you know, they're new to Eighth Blackbird. I see the husband lean over to the wife and go, why are the stagehands coming back out again? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> That's I, and I'm curious about how that experience is different working with uh relatively small new music ensemble and then and then working with the brooklyn philharmonic yeah right right it's it's i mean it's a very different experience um and but what's it's interesting i don't know those differences feel more bridgeable than they did i think when i first started uh imagining doing this job i mean really my first time conducting the whole orchestra of the brooklyn philharmonic was this past week for the russian cartoon music show okay. and you know, they're totally different worlds. I mean, one of the great things about Alarmable Sound is that it's a group where everybody is equally invested. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, like, everybody is involved in deciding what we're going to do um, and how we're going to do it. And, you know, and, and in the rehearsal process, too, I mean, everybody has a stake and everybody, it's, you know, everybody feels like it's their personal responsibility to make sure that we put on a great show. Um, and... Uh, you know, obviously, like a big orchestra, it's hard to have that sense, that kind of sense of community and involvement and engagement. And, you know, one of my concerns, and I love, I love small ensembles. I love that kind of connection that people have. And, you know, mm -hmm. I love the sense of, you know, we're all in it together, as opposed to the sense of, you know, the maestro who comes in and tells everyone what to do. And then, you know, the players are there just to execute that vision. Um, and, you know, I obviously I know that it's very challenging to make that kind of community in in a large orchestra. Um, but I was also really, like, really pleasantly surprised in the first time working with the Brooklyn Phil at how, at how you know, game everybody was and how open to trying new things and and how much people, like, were really into what we were doing. And, and you know, like, there was... And I actually, I mean, I, I like, I... 
I know this is sort of against the culture of the orchestra, but like I really, you know, I encourage people, players to, you know, listen to one another and don't just follow me and, and, you know, talk and, <laughs> and like, you know, sort things out um, on their own as opposed to waiting, you know, something that like that, as, as opposed to waiting for the conductor to say, you know, there is a problem. Um, because that kind of community and that sense of personal responsibility, I think is a lot of what makes a lot of sound and groups like it really work. And I, you know, like I was actually really encouraged by how much of a sense of community and, um, you know, communal spirit there was in that first time with the Brooklyn Pro. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I was curious, had, had you ever uh, conducted, uh, say, something more than 150 years old? before taking this gig with the Brooklyn Phil? Yeah, I mean, you know, of course, as a student, you know, you do a lot I mean, of as a, as the Alan Pearson. <laughs> the Alan Pearson. Once you, after you had arrived. I think your cat just came in the room, by the way. Well, I am... Oh. The door just opened by itself. Yes, it did. Uh, you know, I, I have to say, I'm not really clear on the distinction between the Alan Pearson and Alan Pearson. <laughs> might be, I don't might understand. Be that. I thought it was pretty clear. The, the no, kind of know, Alan Pearson who's important enough to be on Sound Notion. <laughs> oh. Hey, I'll well, take either Alan Pearson the next. Thank yeah. you, Patrick. <laughs> I mean, this was, you know, I did a couple gigs with. Um, uh, with the Orchestra of St. Luke's, which involves some like rep from some older rep, but really, I mean, you know, this is I have to like I have to sort of dredge the recesses of my brain to really answer that. But I'm I think this is this may be it's certainly one of the first times that I've conducted you know like the standard rep outside of a student situation. Right. And that was you know like that was definitely that was definitely a little scary for me at first. You know, like we did this first concert of Russian cartoon music, um, and you know, there were so many challenges on it. The 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 challenges of um, I mean, the big one is being you know doing all this music that some of it was really hard. Levger Bean's piece, um, which is a new work, was really hard. And then on almost everything we did, there was a challenge of keeping the orchestra together with the click track. Mm -hmm. um, right. Which you know, and in some cases, the click track is full of rubato and changing time because these were pieces like the Shostakovich piece we did. Um, you know, the recording came first. And then the cartoon was made to the recording. Yeah. And the recording had nothing resembling itself. I mean, the tempo is changing constantly on every beat. Yeah. So that was a huge challenge. But I mean, hands down, the thing I was most nervous about was doing, um, was doing the first movement of Eureka. Uh, because that is just so, you know, uh, and it's something I've wanted to do for a long time. But yeah. it, it was definitely outside of my experience. Well, and you immediately open yourself up to all manner of comparisons. Right, you know? exactly. Because right. everybody's heard that piece a hundred times, and they've seen their favorite conductor conduct it, and this, that, and the other, you know, so. That's right. right. And, I mean, also, you know, they have, uh, and this is a real challenge, I think, with doing standard rep, is that everybody has their own, you know, everyone in the orchestra has their own sense of how it, of course, goes. Mm -hmm. And, right. um, you know, like, what was really, what was a real challenge doing that symphony on this concert is, um, Beethoven marks it at dotted half equals 60, and it's never played that fast. Even Norrington, um, who's usually a stickler about marked tempos, takes it slower than that. And, uh, you know, I don't feel it from a, uh, you know, a, a sort of, um, it's not, a, it's not, it's not for like abstract or, you know, uh, a reason that I, like, I, I, that I feel like I want it to go that fast. It's just like when that, when the piece is done at the tempo it's usually done, I just find it really heavy and, and mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I hesitate. I don't want to say boring because it's not boring, but just lacking in energy. So right. you know, but but no one plays it that fast, and so you know, getting the players, you know, up to that kind of speed was really hard. Whereas in the more contemporary stuff, you know, they no one comes in with a with a preformed idea of what it's supposed to sound like, and you know, people's people's uh, sensibilities are more flexible. Well. The audience for this newest book to be uh, like the educated, uh, you know, a musically educated audience, or is it more for like a lay audience? Well, both, hopefully. I mean, the, you know, the, the assignment that I've always had at the New Yorker is to write for the, the generally bright, educated people who subscribe to the magazine. Uh, some of them uh, will know uh, a great deal about classical music and uh, some of them will know next to nothing and so the challenge has always been to write in a way that, that catches the interest of 
both of those groups. And, and so I'm, I always feel as I'm sort of zigzagging back and forth between uh, a slightly more technical point and then uh, a, a sentence or a paragraph by way of very basic introduction, uh, even for the most uh, famous composers of the canon. And so this book and, and The Rest is Noise are, are really designed for uh, a similar kind of audience. Although in the end, all I can do is put words down on paper that, that just seem to satisfy me and, uh, and sort of um, meet whatever standard I'm trying to set for myself. I often think I'm writing for myself aged 18 or something, the, the sort of, you know, skeptical, <laughs> the once very uh, uh, skeptical guy who, who actually didn't care very much about uh, journalism. I didn't, didn't read uh, much mu music criticism at, at that time. So, um, you know, it's, you know, I think anyone who writes or, or composes or, or works in, in any field, you know, you can't spend too much time uh, thinking about your audience or you, you get lost in, in a sort of a, uh, you know, very speculative game. Um, but, uh, but obviously the, the, what really matters to me, if someone comes up to me when I do a reading or, or whatever and, and says, you know, I had actually never heard of Messiaen until you wrote about the quartet from the end of time in, in the New Yorker. And, and I was intrigued and I went and got a recording and, and then I went to see the piece live, and, and now I'm obsessed by Messiaen and, and never miss a performance of uh, his music. And, and that certainly means more to me than, than anything, to, to, to reach out to that kind of reader. It, it makes me think that I'm doing something more than just being a, a functional critic, but, but that I also might be playing a, a role in, in the bigger community of, of music, a, sort of a socially constructive role to some extent. Yeah. That actually kind of reminds me of, of something that I've always really admired about your writing is that you managed to describe the the music that you're writing about um, in a way that is both precise and says something very specific that I can understand, um, you know, something about a piece of music that I may not have heard before, but is still kind of poetic and gives something of um, kind of more emotional or a little bit less concrete about it and I, I've always admired how you you have that balance between those two things because I feel like a lot of music writing is <laughs> this really like wishy-washy you know it doesn't really tell me very much about the piece of music that the person's writing about how do you get to that point well I mean one thing I, I very often do is to pair a technical term with a metaphor, a sort of slightly more poetic turn of phrase by way of explaining what it means to, to someone who doesn't know the technical term, uh, you know, uh, sneering glossando on the trombones. It would be a, a obvious kind of example. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the term itself and then some sense of its uh, uh, effect um, and, uh, and significance. And so on, on various levels, I'm, I'm always doing that, that kind of jockeying back and forth between uh, the, the technical language and, and the, the, the illustrative, uh, the metaphorical language. And I, I always like to try to do that without being too obvious about it, because, you know, when, when a, a critic says, you're well, as you may not know, the glissando means, you know, that's, that's <laughs> irritating to the, to the reader. So I, I try to sort of uh, slip it in without uh, calling a great deal of uh, attention to that kind of explanatory language. And hopefully it can sort of serve two pur purposes at once um, to accomplish the uh, explanation, but also even for someone who knows perfectly well uh, what these terms mean uh, to, to g g give a little moment of, ah, oh, it, is, it is a bit of a sneer, isn't it? Yeah, but um, <laughs> <laughs> this is a very, ba very basic this, example. But, where did um, this accent come from? <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like I can hear the the coattails flapping. He's going, he's going Madonna on us. <laughs> yes, well, uh, but um, yeah. Well, thanks so much. I mean, it's, it really means a lot when uh, when expert people such as yourselves are also. <laughs> <laughs> Alex Ross calls the Sound Notion crew experts. Oh, that's a pull quote now. <laughs> in, in, in listen to this, you, you talk about. You know, traveling with the the St. Lawrence Quartet through a lot of those 
you know, less, um, I don't know, less seemingly, seemingly less cosmopolitan places. Yeah, we went to Joplin, actually. I was yeah. So, so distraught to see the, the catastrophe there, the, the, the tornado. We, we were there uh, in El Paso as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's been, it's sort of something that's come to the fore a little more recently. It wasn't something that I thought a lot about when I first started writing for The New Yorker in 1996, and then I was you know, very keen to talk about a, a, the, the major New York institutions and, and go to Salzburg and, and Bayreuth and, and, and all these places. And more recently, I've, I've trying to, been trying to focus more on uh, American music and, and, and the breadth of uh, American music all across the country. And I'm not quite sure what brought this on. I think it was just curiosity. I think the internet had a, a lot to do with it, just being able to sort of dial up at a, at a moment's notice and see, you know, what the Alabama Symphony is doing this week mm -hmm. and see how they're, they're doing a piece by Paul Lansky. You know, wow, that's, that's interesting. And, and <laughs> thinking, you know, well, you know, how is this going over with, with the audiences there and sort of how are they playing? And I think I was really the, the internet made me more and more curious about uh, uh, sort of all of these uh, organizations, uh, big and small. And so I started fashioning these, these occasional uh, trips uh, to, to, uh, to check it all out. And, and so I went on this sort of orchestra road trip uh, in 2007, and, and then I just did this uh, operatic expedition, and, and, I, and I went on the road with uh, St. Lawrence uh, Quartet, and, and you know, hopefully we'll be able to do uh, more of this in in years to come. And also, I love driving long distances. It's just kind of a personal oh. <laughs> uh, cool. thing with me, and 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 so uh, and, and I like sort of just going to to new places and and some i think that that dovetails nicely with um my uh, sort of a what should be a sort of a, a basic aspect of of a music critic's job uh to to travel to, to places i mean i know you know most critics don't have the budget to do this and again i'm just very lucky uh to to have a, a travel budget and be able to go out on the road mm -hmm. and yeah. you know there's so few critics now with with that, that sort of you know, national frame of reference because we don't have a classical critic at, at a, you know, Time magazine and, and, and Newsweek and, and all these other uh, national publications. I, I mean, uh, I'm one of very, very few now uh, writing uh, regularly about classical music in, in a national magazine. Yeah. I mean, that's kind so, of... Uh, I, I, I read a lot of um, a great journalism professor jeff jarvis and he, he writes a lot about the the kind of future of journalism and mm -hmm. the future of newspapers and whenever he writes these things it always seems to parallel interestingly the, the future of american symphony orchestras um and uh i i know a lot of newspapers and uh other journalistic institutions are struggling where do you see the future of music criticism if if newspapers are having to to cut their budget so steeply especially being that position kind of falling by the wayside i'd say yeah now it's a little bleak because you know of course there's the internet there's there's blogs there's you know a lot of excellent um you know online arts sites now but being affiliated with uh, a newspaper or a magazine you know gives you certain uh, definite advantages, um, editors, um, uh, a, a, a travel budget, um, uh, a sense of just a kind of a sort of the organizing frame of, of you know, writing a piece of a, of a certain length of the sort of discipline of, of, you know, fitting what you have to say into, you know, your, your assigned space for that week and, and the readership. I think above all, you know, I just have this great opportunity at the New Yorker of reaching out to people who are leafing through the magazine and and like trying to read the magazine from cover to cover, you know, whether or not they're interested in what the art critic has to say, the, the music critic, and, and so on. People who, who subscribe uh, have developed a kind of trust, hopefully, uh, that the magazine will, will take them to interesting places. And this is, this is a huge opportunity for a classical music writer. So, you know, on, on the internet, you know, everything gets... Um, uh, 
ghettoized and, and it's sort of harder to find that venue uh, where you can you know, catch readers uh, coming from, from all directions. So, so, you know, I actually have faith, though, that, that, uh, that, that newspapers and magazines uh, aren't going to go away. And, and I've never seen this as an either-or situation. I've always felt with the, with the, the Internet and, and all the, the new media, uh, sort of publication media that have popped up with the Internet can exist side by side. Uh, with, with the, uh, the older media, and, and they can really uh, help each other. So I'm uh, sort of cautiously optimistic on that point. So that is going to do it for the best of Sound Notion TV for 2011. Uh, if you saw something that you liked and you want to subscribe to a show that you haven't seen before, or if you want to find out about more of the shows that you've seen before, you can get that information, as always, at soundnotion.tv. Um, and you can find links to subscribe to all those and catch every episode. We'd love to hear from you. If you think we missed something that, that was what you thought was the best of the year, uh, let us know. You can leave us a comment on the side, or you can send us an email, soundnotiontv at gmail.com. We're also on Twitter at SoundNotion, and we're on Facebook. We'd love to talk to you. Uh, I wanted to... Um, take a minute to thank everyone who's been involved with sound notion tv this first year i'm sure we'll have plenty of time to talk some more about this next week when we have our 50th episode of sound notion we're very proud of that um so i want to thank all of the the hosts and producers at sound notion tv um i want to thank everyone who's helped us build our audience everyone who's been a guest on the show everyone who's been a guest host on the show uh, it's been a, a really great experience. We've met a lot of wonderful people, made a lot of wonderful connections, and mostly I want to thank all the people like you who have listened to the show and watched the show over the last year, the many shows over the, the last year. Um, we really appreciate it. We couldn't do this without you. We wouldn't be doing this if we didn't think somebody was going to be listening to it and taking offense t from it. Um, so thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, I don't like to make a big point of this and I'll probably get in trouble from the guys later for even mentioning this. Um, it's, it's not free to do this. So if you do have, uh, the means, we would really appreciate it. If you could help support us, there are links to do that on our site, soundnotion.tv as well. Um, if you can't do that, that's totally cool. We totally understand. Um, the, 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 really the best thing you can do to help support us is just to share us with your friends. Um, so if, if, if you're not able to make a monetary donation, just tell your friends how, 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 fun, how much fun you have listening to the show and watching the show. So th again, thank you so much for listening to the show and watching all the shows over, over the last year. Uh, we'll have another best of show about this time in 2012 if we're all still around and the world is still around. Um, so join us back next year in 2012. Thanks again so much for watching and listening, and we'll be back in 2012.